The concept of Sunnah in the Muwatta of Malik ibn Anas by Muhammad Yusuf Quraya, 1969, McGill, Montreal, Canada. Chapter 2 Hadith and Sunnah. Hadith is considered a very important factor in the formation of Sunnah. The majority of Muslims hold that Hadith has been the most authoritative basis of Sunnah from the very beginning of Islam. Another group of Muslim jurists maintains that the practice of the Muslim community of a particular region was the chief constituent in shaping the form of Sunnah. We now wish to examine briefly the stands these different groups have taken on the issue of Hadith as the basis of Sunnah. Through this brief perusal, we hope to realize fully the import of the view adopted by Malik on the issue. The Orthodox View of Hadith and Sunnah In the view accepted by Muslim Orthodoxy, Sunnah is the second material source of Islamic law. According to this view, Sunnah consists of the sayings and deeds of the Prophet, or of things which he approved tacitly. Consequently, all traditional law belonging to the Sunnah is divided into one, Sunnat al-Fi'l, or what the Prophet did, two, Sunnat al-Qawl, or what the Prophet enjoined, three, Sunnat al-Takrir, or that which was done or said in the presence of the Prophet and which was not forbidden by him, and which he thus tacitly approved. Furthermore, Sunnah is established only by Hadith going back to the Prophet. Shafi'i is very emphatic on this point, and he does not even recognize Sunnah which is based on practice or consensus. According to Shafi'i, who is the prime architect of this theory, Sunnah and Sunnah of the Prophet are synonymous. Further, Shafi'i inclined to identify Hadith and Sunnah more or less completely. In an answer to a question of Rabi ibn Sulaiman asking how a Hadith from the Prophet is established, Shafi'i says, Every Hadith related by a reliable person as going back to the Prophet is authoritative and can be rejected only if another authoritative Hadith from the Prophet contradicts it. If it is a case of repeal or of a former ordinance by a latter, the latter is accepted. If nothing is known about a repeal, the more reliable of the two hadiths is to be followed. If both are equally reliable, the one more in keeping with the Qur'an and the remaining undisputed parts of the Sunnah of the Prophet is to be chosen. Hadiths from other persons are of no account in face of a hadith from the Prophet, whether they confirm or contradict it. If the other persons had been aware of the hadith from the Prophet, they would have followed it. The Ancient View of Hadith and Sunnah from the earliest jurists and judges, the practice of the community of their respective region had preference over the hadith. The typical example of this view is the very interesting case recorded by Tabari. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr ibn Muhammad ibn Amr ibn Hazm was a judge in Medina, and when he had given a judgment contrary to a hadith and come home to his brother, Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, who was a pious man, he would say to him, my brother, you have given this or that judgment today. Muhammad would say, yes, my brother. Abdullah would ask, what of the hadith, my brother? The hadith is important enough to have the judgment based upon it. Muhammad would reply, alas, what of the practice? Malik explains Muhammad's view in these words. Whatever practice was agreed upon in Medina and the agreed practice according to them was preferable to the hadith. And then the Arabic is given, so it's not in Arabic, but I'll try and read it. مَا أَجْمَعَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْعَمَلِ بِالْمَدِينَةِ وَالْعَمَلِ الْمُجْتَمَعَةِ إِنْدَهُمْ أَقْوَى مِنَ الْحَدِيثِ So that's uh, a translation. The seven lawyers of Medina were primarily fuqaha, as, they were, as their epithet suggests, and it was only secondarily what they related, uh, what they said that related to hadith. And only secondarily that they related hadiths, so they were primarily fuqaha. They were Sa'id ibn Musayyib, who died in 93 AH, Urwa bin Zubair, 94 AH, Abu Bakr ibn Ubaid, 94 AH, Qasim bin Muhammad, 108 AH, Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah, died 98 AH, Sulaiman bin Yasser, 100 AH, Kharija bin Zayd, 100 AH. These were the people who laid down the foundations of Medanis fiqh. They were not traditionists who, are preoccupied, who preoccupied themselves with the transmission of hadiths. Rather, they were the jurists who engaged themselves with juridical opinions and relied upon hadiths rarely. In the time of Malik, those jurists who compiled Muwatta did not even think it necessary to mention hadiths from the Prophet in their compilations. 
Rather, they relied wholly upon the generally agreed practice of Medina and the consensus of the scholars of Medina. Almost the same was the case of the Syrian jurists. al awzai their chief representative, incessantly and recurrently invoked the practice of the Muslims of his time, which, according to him, had its starting point with the Prophet, and was followed by the Caliphs after him, and verified by the scholars. Refuting Abu Hanifa's view on the selling and buying of slaves captured in enemy territory, al awzai states, The Muslims have always been buying and selling war captives in Dar al-Harb, the abode of war. Professor Shat remarks, the continuous practice of the Muslims in is decisive is the decisive element. Reference to the the continuous practice of the Muslims is the decisive element. Reference to the Prophet or to the first caliphs is optional, but necessary for establishing it. The orthodox view of Sunnah was not yet known to the school of Abu Hanifa. For them, Sunnah meant the established religious practice. Though the concept of Sunnah of the Prophet was known to them, as is clear from Abu Yusuf's use of the term, a Sunnah and a Rasul. وعن السلف من أصحاب من أشبه ومن قوم فقهاء. so problems with the Arabic because there is no uh, Arabic text. nevertheless, their reliance on the Sunnah in the meaning of recognized practice, a Sunnah المحفوظة المعروفة, had preference over it over any other argument. For example, Abu Hanifa holds that the property of non-Muslims who embrace Islam and migrate to Dar al-Islam will not be given to him, rather it will be treated as booty, meaning war booty, in case the non-Muslim territory falls to the Muslims. Awza'i, rejecting this view, supports this by advancing a hadith that the Prophet did not treat the properties of the immigrants, uh, Muslims, from Mecca as booty. Abu Yusuf explains Abu Hanifa's view against Awza'i, who advanced a hadith from the Prophet on the issue. Against the hadith, Abu Yusuf says that the practice of the Muslims has been on Abu Hanifa's side, and the Prophet's treatment of the Meccans was an exception. Thus he asserts, so has, been this, so has been the Sunnah and the practice of Islam, although the Prophet did not do so in Mecca. This evidence is a clear indication of the fact that the hadith as such was not identical with the Sunnah in the view of Abu Hanifa and Abu Yusuf, nor is it necessarily based upon the hadith. After referring to many hadiths from the Prophet, Abu Yusuf concludes that these hadiths contradict the Sunnah, therefore they are not acceptable. Only the Sunnah based on the spirit and the letter of the teachings of the Prophet is binding, and all the hadiths will be accepted or rejected or interpreted in view of this Sunnah. Abu Yusuf treats all those hadiths which do not conform to the Sunnah as an exception to the Sunnah. For example, he contends that at the Battle of Hawazin, the Prophet returned the war captives to Banu Hawazin. But this practice of the Prophet will not be accepted in face of the Sunnah generally accepted by the Muslims. On the question of giving some fixed share to the women and dhimmis who take part in a battle alongside the Muslims, Abu Yusuf, refuting Awza'i's view, couches his argument in an ambiguous term. And the term says uh, it's in Arabic, so uh, the Arabic is not given. Um, it says, the translation, I cannot imagine anyone knowing a sunnah and a sirah who can be ignorant of it. Uh, and then he says, On the problem of allot uh, allotting shares from the booty to each of the two horses bought by some warriors in battle, Abu Yusuf rejects the hadith adduced by Awza'i and characterizes it as solitary, shav, i.e. not recognized by practice. It seems his view of sunnah, which is the standard of judgment with him, constitutes the religious and moral principles embodied in the Qur'an and in the generally recognized Sunnah. As-Sunnah al-Ma'rufa. Stay tuned for many more parts.